media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR Newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. He's speaking to us from Arizona. Welcome back to the show, Mark. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Jim. Mark, do we have a special offer for our listeners? We do at VRTrader.com. That's VRTrader.com. Uh, you said 50% off. We're continuing to offer this as a courtesy to House Street. It is a uh, promo code of 2021 half off. 2021 half off for any of the newsletters for any length of time. So I suggest a longer time frame if you're interested because uh, special may not be around for the rest of the year. Typically, this time of year, Mark, we have choppy stock markets and then a Santa Claus rally. Are we seeing the same thing this year? It, it looks like that could be happening. We had this um, Omicron, uh, I don't know, I think it's mass psychosis, but we can get into that whole thing. It seems like, you know, there's never any end to the uh, COVID uh, disaster, but uh, there there is a historical tendency for you know, there's the turkey shoot. We talked about that around Thanksgiving, the day after or the day before. It turned out it was the day before. Then you run into a little bit of a correction after the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, oftentimes you'll see a pullback into early December, sometimes mid-December. And then you get the Santa Claus rally and strength generally into the new year. Of course, the first few days of the new year are important to me because of the early warning system based on the old theory of Yale Hirsch from the Stock Traders Almanac back in the 1970s, where the early first five days in the month of January could give you a sense for the year. So uh, if you are strong into early January, that bodes well for 2022. Meanwhile, we just want to see what the patterns are. But you know, a lot of bad news here took the market down, the fear-mongering going on about the uh, the virus, and, um, and then fear, of course, that... Um, Suddenly, the Federal Reserve is going to get more aggressive with interest rates. So that sort of is a parallel to this uh, current correction. But normally, we pull out of it that we do see a little bit of a uh, Santa Claus rally. So I don't think the Fed is going to be Mr. Grinch this year. I think they would like to send everybody home happy. So that my gut feeling is they'll probably either hold back on any interest rate activity, change their mind a little bit, perhaps even coming out saying, well, we got this new virus, and that's uncertainty. Maybe we shouldn't be rushing right now, and uh, that kind of that kind of discussion. You know what I mean? So I'm thinking that that might help support a Santa Claus the rebound. So let's see how it un- unfolds here. But that's sort of my gut feeling at the moment. Now, when the market corrected for a few days in a row, everybody was blaming it. Oh, my God, there's a variant. Well, come on, folks, get get used to it. It's a virus. Things change. Do they like to find excuses for market drops when really everybody else is telling me it's overbought, it's overvalued, you're going to have dips, and they're just trying to claim that this is the cause? Well, the, the big cause, supposedly, was fear of what the Fed's going to do or not do, because the Fed, you know, Powell start talking, you know, about how he has to get more aggressive, where he was originally saying, you know, they, they don't need to get aggressive, so this may be political pressure on them, but then the virus shows up, which, you know, Again, could alleviate that that pressure on their part. I mean, I'm sort of the view, and I, I'm probably the one of the few out there who would say it. I, I, you know, I don't believe rates are really going up. I mean, you know, what, what are we talking about anyway? And since uh, 2008, nine, ever since the financial crisis back then, we've been in low rates now for all these years, and there's been intermittent talk about rates going up, and maybe they pop up a little bit and they come right back down again. So. Uh, I don't think problems are going away that fast, and certainly of these viruses or other, uh, out, I call them outlier events, keep popping up, and I, I still have a strong feeling there are other outlaw, outlier events out there, black swans, as they call them, 
that are down the road that uh, could keep the Fed in in abeyance. So you know, I'm, I'm so still in the low interest rate mentality and. You know, well, again, what are we talking about? I mean, rates aren't going from zero to five percent. I mean, you know, even if they do go up, it's such a modest thing. It's, it's hardly even worth talking about. I don't think that affects consumers or businesses that much. I think it affects the Fed and the U.S. Treasury more because they got to pay higher, you know, returns on the debt, and it's that extraordinary debt right now. So I don't think they have any great incentive to raise to raise rates. So just a lot of chit chat about it all. That's sort of where I'm at. But you know, we're technicians, and we'll see how it plays out coming into next year we certainly the market certainly is high enough that when we get these sharp shakes like we just saw it's not unexpected meanwhile there's geomagnetic storms possible here in the next day or two um, reading based on the research that we get from those sources we have a solar eclipse which is hitting on december 4th it's mostly to be seen down across antarctica so most people in the world aren't going to see it i think maybe somewhere in south southern africa it might be might be visible, and it's funny that it's in Antarctica, which you know I've, I've been writing and talking about. And many others have been talking about for many, many years as a seat of a lot of secret uh, science activity and some great stories coming out of there that border on science fiction, which we don't have to get into in this conversation. But it's funny that the solar eclipse is down by Antarctica, and then you know we've got other things going on out there. It's really funny. I mean, we really talk about the geocosmic and so forth, too, and I like to get off on that tangent. Of course, we, we may have touched on this last week. You know, NASA launched that crash into asteroid defend the planet mission, you know, and that's uh, something that we've been all talking about here, and people sort of joke, but I put it in my website, a list of all the near-Earth asteroids that are out there, and there's a great video that I posted on my website last night. You know, you had that asteroid that came in over uh, Russia, in 2019 and blew up before it hit the earth and it wasn't that big but i was told it was the size of the eiffel tower in any event uh, that caused a lot of damage and we sort of discount the geocosmic you know it's like our, our world is what's on financial news or what's on the weather channel or what the neighbor next door is talking about and you know there's bigger things happening out there well obviously powers that be felt there is a need to uh launch a mission to crash into an asteroid to defend the planet Earth, which is really what this is all about. And I think it's just fascinating whether we're going to be successful in that or not. Some of the videos I've seen say it's a bigger task than uh, that, we're really, that we're really talking about here, that just because you hit an asteroid doesn't mean it's going to change direction and it could split up into pieces and then come back together again and hit us in many directions. So it's a very complicated process. And then going over the research, too, that I, you know, some other people uh, – I was, you know, reading and analyzing in the scientific community. They say, well, forget the uh, asteroids. Uh, the real risk, the biggest risk to the planet is really um, the super volcanoes. And that sort of surprised me because, you know, there's about 10 of them, and I posted them on my website. The biggest, most notable one, of course, is uh, the Yellowstone super volcano. But say this could end life on Earth as much or greater than uh, the asteroids. So, you know, you could sit here, and this is sort of fun stuff to talk about, you know, it could happen in a million years or in 10 years or one year, but, uh, you know, these are the kind of things you like to focus on, including the um, solar activity and things that could affect us that we really have no control over. You know, the virus I think we have control over because it's obviously, in my opinion, a bad party out there intentionally creating or circulating these viruses. I don't just think they're natural mutations and they're suddenly appearing by accident, even though viruses do mutate and that kind of thing does happen. You know, there's some grand conspiracy beyond all this and a grand plan and i've been saying that from the day COVID hit so there's something that we're being prepared for maybe it is the asteroid maybe it's a super volcano maybe it's some extraterrestrial contact there's something out there that why we were why the planet has been subjected to mass psychosis with regard to this uh, ongoing pandemic and the, the likelihood that it's going to continue and continue, it's like we have to be kept under control on a certain level. It really, it really is so clear to me, but obviously to others, who just say, "Oh, we got another virus, and let's just get another shot." But I think it's much more significant than that. There's a greater plan behind all this. So, got off on a tangent a little bit, but that's sort of my introductory comment for today. Now, we had Jerome Powell say inflation is going to stick around now, and the Fed for months was saying it's transitory, it's transitory. In other words, you don't know what to believe from these people. It's, it, it's motivated by politics. It's, um, 
it, you know, there, there's so much, there's so much beyond all this that, you know, it's sort of crazy. What's going on in the rest of the world? Uh, is, is, is the supply issue really as good, as bad as it is, or is it, or is it worse? Is it, um, being created? Is it artificial or is it, is it real? Um, you know, money drives a lot of things. Obviously, if, if there's shortages, you can jack prices up and, you know, many could profit by that, whether it's real or artificial. Uh, the Fed, of course, you know, has got its own agenda and it could be, again, politically influenced, as I just mentioned. Um, you know, the bottom line is, uh, I don't think that any change in rates, if it occurs, is going to be all that dramatic anyway. But I just have a gut feeling that even if rates do go up or this tapering uh, process begins, it could easily be reversed as it has in the past. I remember in the old days, uh, uh, Alan Greenspan, and I, this is going way back to the 1980s, early 90s. You know, I used to write about it way back then, and I used to compare Alan Greenspan to a New York taxi cab driver because he would slam on the brakes and then he would slam on the accelerator and then back to the brakes again with regard to interest rates. I mean, very inconsistent behavior. And though that's changed a little bit on the part of the Fed, they're certainly capable of it. And then they have so many other tools at their disposal, Jim. You know, we've talked about this. I mean, people think in terms of uh, buying of the bonds, the tapering, the interest rates, and they're not talking about market manipulation, the fact that they're in there and it's already been documented. They buy the... S&P futures, or they they support or defend uh, the commodity markets. They actually go in there and buy st- individual stocks. There's no discussion about that. I mean, the kind of shenanigans going on is is so great that it, there's very little, if any, discussion about it. It just, you know, it's a, it's actually a joke when you really think about it because they're not telling you everything they do or can't do. And uh, the markets markets are clearly manipulated by them, by outside forces that play with the futures and the stocks, and it's just not interest rates. So, you know, maybe they raise interest rates, but they go in and buy stocks, and they keep the stocks up even though rates are going up because they want to keep the market strong to keep everybody optimistic. Who knows what their strategy is, but it's just unbelievable what's really going on, and it's just, it's just not talked about. It's like taboo. With inflation running rampant, shouldn't gold and silver prices be skyrocketing right now? Okay, well, you know, normally you would think that, but for for for, for decades, uh, the gold market has been manipulated. There's a group called GATA, G A T E dot org. I've been friends with them for for years. Uh, Bill Murphy, in particular, heads that out. Tremendous amount of research about the manipulation in the gold and silver market, how uh, the prices are suppressed, the lending of the, of the gold, which uh, sometimes exceeds the actual amount that, that exists, whether there's actually gold in uh, uh, Fort Knox or not, whether it's been sold and dis- disposed of many decades ago. There's been no clear proof that it's all there. I mean, you know, on and on and on. And of course, you got to get good backing up to the futures shenanigans. Uh, there's been, you know, documented and a- anecdotal evidence that you've got the government in there through its uh, uh, agents suppressing the prices by hitting bids on the futures prices for gold and silver, even though there's no uh, physical gold or silver backing up the sale of those future sales. They just have a big checkbook. So uh, if, if gold and silver have been left alone, they'd be significantly higher than they are now. But it, you know, it embarrasses governments if gold and silver are strong. It diminishes their economic policy, uh, their inflation forecasts, uh, on and on and on. So they manipulate the market. So I only assume... You know, gold has its runs up and down. I guess they let it run once in a while or not. And I know the supposed fundamental reason why it should go up, but the reason it hasn't gone up again. It's being uh, it's being manipulated by the governments of the world. And you know, when will they let loose? Will that change? I know they were trying to get a new board member to the Federal Reserve. I forgot her name. She she went before the U.S. Senate, I believe. She was not approved. She was somewhat of a gold bug, and she wanted to change some of the policies there, and they wouldn't let her in because I think they want to keep gold and silver under control. So at some point, I guess it'll break loose, maybe if a scandal hits, maybe if uh, they can overcome these uh, other forces that, that, that I can't really say. But, uh, you know, right now, that that's my explanation. Fundamentally, you can argue it should be higher, and it's not. So what you do is you have to trade it. It's in a little bit of a downtrend now, and uh, it looks like it's a little oversold. You're in a seasonally positive period, and theory should carry into February, but so far that hasn't happened. But there have been some peri- pe- previous periods, Jim, 
and I don't have all of them in front of me, but I remember we see down December's in gold, a lot of tax loss selling, a lot of negatives, and then boom, come January, it explodes to the upside, and there's a nice trade. So maybe we're setting up for a trade into early next year, regardless of government interference or not. So let's see how it plays out. We'll have more with Mark Leibovit right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Mark Leibovit. Mark, OPEC says it's going to pump more oil in the new year. The president released the U.S. oil. Oil reserve, are we going to see lower gasoline prices, or was that already in the books? Pretty much in the books, in my opinion. I mean, the chart said we were way overbought. Um, actually, in our service, we were along the inverse ETF for uh, crude oil. It was ticker symbol DRIP, D-R-I-P, on the U.S. markets. And uh, it rallied you know, a little bit as, as uh, crude oil came down. So it said that we're going to get a correction, and we got a nice little correction in it. Um, I, I'm reasonably satisfied that we probably saw just about all, you know, all we needed to do technically. I mean, it was a, it was really extended and, uh, it sort of hit my targets and I could be wrong and maybe there's going to be a little bit more of a correction and it was a technical event, just way overdone, had a shake out. So I'm more in the camp that you saw the correction in crude oil, uh, cause I'm just looking at the charts as I'm talking to you and, and they, they all pulled back to support levels that I was looking for. Uh, again, nothing is carved in stone, and I guess they could break those support levels, but uh, it's pretty much looked to me like this was the expected correction. So uh, I'm a bull on crude oil overall. I mean, there's, there's shortages out there. Uh, releasing any any amount of crude oil from the uh, the national emergency reserves, whatever they call them, I'm told, is, is a small fraction of what the, <laughs> you would really need to drive prices lower. You know, companies are not exploring. They're afraid of the green movement. Uh, pipelines are shut down. Projects shut down. Uh, there's going to be big need for crude oil, even to create the solar and uh, green energy and an EV movement that everybody is excited about. So overall, uh, again, I'm making big picture predictions, but I think gold, kind of gold crude, is going to be back to its highs of 2007. What's that? $140 a barrel, and possibly a lot higher than that over the next few years. So uh, I think it's just a correction. Now, in the greater Vancouver area, we're still under gasoline rationing, uh, 30 liters of fill-up, 7.5 U.S. gallons per fill-up because of massive flooding that has hit not just uh, the Fraser Valley, which is just east of Vancouver, but several uh, towns and cities and villages uh, throughout British Columbia. Rail lines are cut. Freeways are dissected. Uh, mile-long stretches have disappeared into rivers. Rivers have moved uh, a mile off their regular course. Pipelines are shut down. Uh, and uh, Vancouver is one of the major ports in North America for goods from Asia. So if your Japanese-made slippers or Chinese-made uh, household goods don't show up on time, they might be stuck in the port of Vancouver because uh, we're still restricted from uh, all the flooding that happened two weeks ago. We're told we had the wettest November ever, and now I'm looking at the forecast for the next week we're supposed to get snow. So maybe we can skate down a frozen Trans-Canada Highway that still remains flooded in several places. And, and that, that that's not going to help uh, prices go down, is it? Uh, and, and it won't for everybody. Uh, I, again, uh, I think a, a lot of Americans are unaware of how many goods that come out of Vancouver and ha are destined for some place in the U.S. And they're just not going to be there. Not on time, anyway. Or maybe they'll be spoiled. Right. So, you know, the, the uh, supply shortage issue uh, or the inflation issue, which Powell had referred to as being temporary, may not be so temporary and it's sort of funny or perverse that suddenly you've got an outlier event like these heavy rains and snow hitting uh canada uh just at a time when it, it, it appeared things might be settling down a little bit so i that's why i pay attention to outlier events or the risk of outlier events and uh how they change you know your forecast uh, pretty dramatically so i think that it's more of the same that we've uh experienced and uh you're going to probably see another surge in 
in commodity prices because of shortages and uh, you know crop issues and delivery of food and food prices are going up. I mean, I go into the stores. I don't know what it is up in Canada, but you know the big name stores and Costco and all these other vendors. The, the shelves aren't as full as they used to be, and the selection is is less. So. It, it, it's going to it's going to be a more of a problem ahead. I don't see it being solved so quick, but let's see what happens. You got to be prepared. Well, the U.S. released its uh, strategic oil reserve, or a little bit of it. In Canada, we have released half of our strategic maple syrup reserve. <laughs> okay. uh, that's a real story. <laughs> okay. Well, my pancakes are going to feel a lot better on Sunday morning. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Don't get fooled by that fake corn syrup stuff. That has the pictures of pancakes on it. The the real deal tastes a whole lot better and is a whole lot better for you. Oh, I, I'm a big follower of pure maple syrup. The other stuff, like the Aunt Jemima thing that you guys used to used to have as a kid, it's all sugar. I I agree with you 100. percent So that's funny. Mark, thank you so much for chatting with us. Have a great week weekend. Talk to you next week. Thanks, Jim. My guest has been Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. He was speaking to us from Arizona. If you have any questions for Mark, he'll answer them if you send them to info at HowStreet.com. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.